It's a cold day in a Cardiff back alley, and the Doctor Who team are making one of the most unusual episodes in the drama's history. First episode ever, the Doctor and his companion barely make an appearance, the monster has been designed by a nine-year-old child, and it's the comedian Peter Kay who brings that ogre to life. Hello. Hi. Come on, join us. Dissolve into me. So that's how it flies. Lordy God, episode 10. Episode 10 was like having having a long shopping list of, of things like um, not much Doctor and Rose because we were double banking. And what double bank banking means is shooting two episodes at the same time. At the same time, we had the Blue Peter competition winner, which was brilliant, and I'm so glad we did that, where that young lad invented the Absorbaloff. The William Grantham uh, has come up with the Absorbaloff. There it is. At the same time, I'd had a letter from Peter Kay saying I'm dying to be in Doctor Who, and you begin to think Absorbaloff, Peter Kay. That's the various elements start to come together. Well, it's like a, a, a childish dream come true to be in Doctor Who and to be an alien. Give me the cane! Then he snaps it, yeah. and I go, damn you stupid man, no! And that's when I start getting sucked into the ground. Yeah. It's not that we got lots of time off while episode 10 was being filmed. We were, we were doing episodes eight and nine at the time. Um, so it was weird to think that there was a whole other unit out and around Cardiff. He'll die. Um, making an episode of Doctor Who that He'll the Doctor die, knows Doctor. that really had very little to do with. I had to come up with a story that, that had to have a logical reason for not having much of the Doctor and Rose in it. That's what it did. It went... Rah! And if you think that was the most exciting day of my life, wait till you hear the rest. Oh, boy. It's one of the most, you know, unusual and left field, I think, of all the Doctor Who scripts, but it really works. It was really exciting reading it because it's like, this is so different. In terms of Doctor Who, it's pretty much the only time that's happened, that there's a story which isn't from the point of view of, of the Doctor or, or his companion. That was my family home down there. I did try, but there's two women live there now and a bit severe. So never mind. But but that is where it all started. Because that's when I first met the doctor. Russell um, T. Davis didn't want him to be geeky and uh, you know, he didn't want like a funny voice or funny he's a normal guy, he's a sweet guy, you know, he's just he's quite wide eyed and innocent and he's you know, and he's just looking for the truth and trying to find out what happened to him when he was younger. You know, he thinks we'll find that by finding the doctor and I think he sees that finally you know, finds a bit of wisdom at the end, you know, it's like he sees the Doctor and becomes enlightened, I think. Well, that's how I'm playing anyway. But. <laughs> it's Mark Warren's episode, it's his, it's his story that we follow, and, and, and Billy and I are, 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 you know, visiting guest artists, really. Interesting, sort of absorbatrix. Absorb clon, absorb loft. It's been absolutely fantastic, fantastic, and tomorrow uh, I get my alien costume. What appears as only a few seconds on screen actually involves an all-night shoot on the streets of Cardiff as Mark Warren begins his Doctor Who debut. Today we've just um, we've just done a scene where I'm walking by a load of shops and uh, the window explodes and uh, these autons come out. I was stocking up, no, nothing special, all the usual stuff. When all of a sudden. Susie, the girl that's lying lying down in front of the tables, can she be dead rather than agony? Actually still, totally still. And then we just had to run in front of that cab. 
uh, but it's a stuntman called Bill who I worked with before actually. He has to come up quite fast and you have to sort of, as long as you hit your mark, he promises he won't break your legs. <laughs> Again, one of the great things about Doctor Who is that it can embrace actors, every different type of actor. You know, we can have someone like Pauline Collins or Simon Callow who are known as, as great proper actors. And then you can have Peter Kay, who's known as a, a comedian, a comic actor. And yet the, the, there's something about the, the elasticity of this show that it can take both of them on board and it, and anyway, it, it seems equally it right. Because it's, it's some kind of herpes and it's took over my body. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Like I'm like a walking, talking. I'm not saying anything. That's, I can't look compete at me. with look him. At me. What he's been able to do is, is make it exciting, but also make it very funny, which I think so refreshing. I really do. Not from Rex Corica are you? No, I'm not the swine. I spit on them. I was born on the twin planet. Really? What's the twin planet, Rex Corica Phalopatorius? Clon. Plum. Plum, yes. When I first saw the absorber laugh, well, first of all, I saw Peter Kay. That made me laugh. And then I saw Peter Kay in this Order big nine. green fat suit Order with a nine. big old Mohican that started here and ended up halfway down his back. That was funny. And then he was playing this monster with a serious northern accent. It was just one of the funniest days. We meet at last. We do sort of dare to push the comedy, perhaps slightly further than we normally do. But then, again, that's part of the joy of Doctor Who, is that you can do that. One week you can have something as dark as some of the elements in the Satan pit. Oh. Oh, and then the next week you can you can have running through doors and, and you know, the wrong coloured buckets of water and all that stuff. <laughs> Not it's something you've got to be careful with. It's like, um, you don't want to get daft with it. And I know Peter's absolutely concerned that, that he's going to do it for real. Wildly Absorbloff is in himself very funny. Um, he's also very threatening. He also is a genuine danger and ruins Elton's life. Um, so there is something genuine behind the Absorbloff. And I wanted that for Blue Peter as well. The idea behind the Absorber Loft is so smart and I met the kid that uh, designed the Absorber Loft and I spoke to him about it. Uh -huh. Is this what you thought it would look like? Um, yeah. Better. Yeah? Oh. Good, isn't it? Did he always have the hair? Um, yeah, he's always had the hair. This mm. weekend. The idea that this monster just goes around absorbing people, it's really, it's really, really, really clever. And, uh, and, and really quite terrifying as well. You're still rolling? Yeah, yeah. All right. He'll die, Doctor! Come on. You can't let him. I'm Mr. Skinner. Shut up! Shit, Paul! Shut up! <laughs> A year ago, the Absorbolov lived only in the mind of a nine-year-old child who had entered a Blue Peter competition. Today, we go backstage as the Doctor goes face to face with the monsters he is yet to do battle with. Um, I'm on Blue Peter. It's uh, it's Wednesday, the something of August, and it's the it's the final of the Doctor Who Design a Monster competition. So I'm here to uh, to reveal the winner to the nation. And the whole team has had to lend a hand to open them. It's been our biggest Blue Peter competition since way back in 1993. But the big question is, how many entries did we receive? Well, here's the Dalek with the magic number. The Blue Peter Designer Monster Competition received 43,900.
920 entries. What about that? Lots of entries. That's a massive amount. And it's had more entries than for any competition since 1993. And I think that shows how much Doctor Who is connected with this audience of 8 to 12 year olds. There was actually a competition years ago. I, I don't, didn't enter it, but I just remember it being on. And I remember seeing a clip from Blue Peter where they previously did a, a, make a design a Doctor Who monster. Now it's five to five and time for Blue Peter. If you watch television at the weekend, I'm quite sure you probably follow the adventures of the amazing Doctor Who. However, in 1967, the lucky winner would never have seen his monster actually confront the Doctor. We want you to design a monster that's tough enough to beat the Daleks. It can be any shape or size you want, but it must have at least one deadly secret weapon that's never been used on Doctor Who before. I think one of the nicest things that Russell Davis did in the last series was to include a bit of Blue Peter in Doctor Who as a kind of nod to the fact that over 40 years or so, you know, Blue Peter have constantly promoted Doctor Who. And when you've stuck your fins on, you can cover the whole lot in buttercream. Ooh, here's one I made a little bit earlier, and look at that. Your very own spaceship, ready to eat. I think these monsters are pretty good, actually. I think I, I don't know what I was expecting, but it, it's the standard of the drawing's really high. Apart from the design as well, there, there, there's some really creative ones going on in there. You do wonder if some of these have been sent in by 45-year-old graphic designers, actually, because some of them are that good. Uh, indeed. OK, let's move on to the eights, nines and tens, Tim. The one who's going to win this grand prize, yeah. they're going to come down to the Doctor Who studios, Ooh. they're going to see the monster being made, they're yeah. going to come on set, they're going to meet me and Billy and everyone else. Who is it? <laughs> it is... Uh, William from... Hey! The Absorbaloth is a green sumo creature and um, he absorbs his prey and um, dissolves to digest them. <laughs> this is Absorbaloth that was given to me by Peter Kay and it says here to William mm -mm, best wishes Peter Absorbaloth Kay. Peter Kay. I mean, I really like the design. I, I love the, the faces all over it and all that kind of thing and the size of it, you know, because you, you, it's not just a human being with them. It's, he's also gone for the bigger and there's, like, no neck and stuff. So there's a real character in it. I mean, Doctor Who's got a great tradition of having really good actors inside some of these monsters. <laughs> What can I do for you, Doctor? Exquisite. Tonight is your lucky night. It's not possible. Uh, <laughs> I'm finding all this a bit disturbing. Uh, <laughs> Ragwa, Ken Ben, Love and a Mist, Fennel Sesame. My face. There is one who has betrayed me. <gasps> yes! We'd best be wary of him. You've got to stick to your precious schedule, is that it? That puts an entirely different complexion on the situation. What exactly is that creature? You are the weakest link. Goodbye. Peekaboo! I saw nothing but an illusion. Quite what connects all these people, we have no idea. Absolutely. It tastes like chicken. We get guest stars coming in, and they love coming in to be the monster. I mean, Zoe Wan, want to make her loved being Cassandra. And with Peter Kay, um, the moment he knew the Absorbal Off was up for grabs, actually, the moment we started talking many months ago, it was something he latched onto and thought that would be brilliant. You wouldn't let an innocent man die, and I'll absorb him unless you give yourself to me. I got a call from him in January saying, would you like to play a UFO spotter? And I said, I don't know. Sounds a bit like Roy Cropper, that, in Coronation Street, tank top and all that. And then I said, I'd, I'd much rather be a baddie. You've doubled with aliens. Now meet the genuine article. Oh, my God. That young lad invented the Absorbaloff, and we had the Absorbaloff made, and that's a great triumph, I think, that, that one of our younger viewers actually invented that. We've used that as the inspiration, and we've kept certain aspects, you know, there he, he has like a mohawk hairstyle and he's a big large character and these funny black trousers and the faces in there and he's green, you know, there's a lot of key elements but obviously we've just had to tweak the look of him to just make him work a bit more. 
they had added an extra touch of detail and done it well and made him really looking like he's fat and everything. And they made him um, look really fat with all the flubber. It was a great story actually the other day. Um, Blue Peter took the lad who designed the absorbal off round to Neil Gorton to see the prosthetics, to see the absorbal off being made. And what the little lad hadn't said was that he imagined the absorbal off was the size of a double decker bus. So he was actually quite disappointed that it was <laughs> it was a man in a costume. And we're like, well, you never said. So <laughs> if we'd known, I would have written in, oh my God, you're the size of a double decker bus. Oh, oh wow. That is just oh, How cool. Come on, we'll... Hello! <laughs> Who are you? That is so cool. Yeah. Look at that! Look at that! It looks so cool! Look at that! You're looking very green today. I know, green Peter. You've got to keep a certain amount of Peter K, especially in the face. You know, you can't change it so far beyond just a regular face that it becomes pointless having Peter K. I mean, if you get Peter K inside of a, a, being a Doctor Who monster, you want it to be Peter K. Yeah. Look at that hot tub! Yeah. Look at that wine rack! Incredible! And over in the corner there, just past them cows, is a discotheque. Yeah. There you go. And summer, a little right? chef. Not a, not a restaurant, an actual little chef. Aha! I need your help. So fancy a trip in the TARDIS? Something amazing happened in the world of Doctor Who, because waiting for its return was the power of the internet, mobile phones and interactive TV. And this power is in the hands of a brand new generation. This new world demands its own original material, with interactive adventures like Attack of the Grask speaking directly to a new, young audience. Attack of the Grask was an interactive TV game that we made specifically for children. Challenge. Reckon you can hack it as my companion? I only take the best, remember? Like Rose. Basically, Doctor after the Christmas episode, children could press red and they would be presented by the Doctor himself in the TARDIS, offering them the, the ability to prove themselves as his assistant. Now's your chance. Only time to do one of two things. That control panel, take a look. Press one to teleport, two for stasis. Make a choice. Doctor Who was always ahead of, ahead of its time. You know, it was about futuristic things that we didn't understand. Whereas now, some of those futuristic things are just commonplace. So you get extra bits of Doctor Who by pressing the red button or whatever, and that's only right. Because Doctor Who, when it was off air, off the television, survived in different mediums. You know, on the internet, you know, in audio adventures. It's always been there. And, uh, and so it's... It's back on the telly, but all of these other avenues are still available to it. Before Doctor Who came back, uh, the BBC's Doctor Who website had an enormous audience uh, of very, very dedicated fans of the old series. And your typical uh, audience member would be mid-twenties, maybe up to mid-thirties, most probably male. Doctor! The way it all changed was the night the first episode went out because we got 900 emails that night. And a lot of them were from proud parents. Some of them had even taken pictures of terrified children. That was week one. By week three, we were getting emails from the kids. That's more like it. Children have always um, aspired upwards. If you work in magazines, you know that if you name your magazine just 17, the girls who buy it are going to be 14 and 15, and the minute you get to 17, you're not interested in it anymore. <laughs> Doctor Who doesn't talk down to kids, because clearly it's understood and appreciated by adults. So it actually pitches to an adult level, and I think kids like that. I think the great thing about Doctor Who now is that it's completely magical. <laughs> you want to go off into that magical world, because the audience does want that escapism. They do want to be in that, that world. Oh, I love this. Can I just say, travelling with you, I love it. Me too. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> so you used to look at Doctor Who forums and Doctor Who message boards and it would be people actually talking about the quality of the show, their theories about the mythology of the Doctor Who universe. All that's changed. And it's still going on, 
but there's this other lovely thread of um, people who are just immediately expressing their love for David or Billy. And then you've got kids who are building their first website ever, all over the place. Really exciting, moving Daleks, barking noises, TARDISes, everything, all on one page with all the colours they can possibly manage. But that's great because that's the first website they've ever built and they've decided to build that about Doctor Who. What I set out to do was to get people watching who don't watch science fiction, which is specifically women and, and specifically younger kids watching as well who, do, who wouldn't feel excluded from it. Um, and women, it was absolutely deliberate policy. Of, uh, there is a cliche that men are the traditional viewers of science fiction. And it is one of those cliches that's a bit true, actually. They are attracted to that sort of material. A lot of the American shows are designed for men. It's uh, something to do with the doctor. She's been reading the website. Please come through. I'm in the shed. Oh. She? She's read a website about the doctor? She's a she? Despite the fact that most children weren't even born when Doctor Who left our screens, as soon as it returned, it captured their imaginations. And it was no longer just for the boys. I think with, with Doctor Who, the new audience that came to it, it helped with the first episode, Rose, because the children were learning with Rose all about this amazing Time Lord. The first time she stepped into the TARDIS, they did as well. So Rose's kind of shock, horror, what is this? I'm inside a TARDIS. Um, the audience were going through that as well. Where do you want to start? Um, the inside's bigger than the outside? Yes. It's, it's alien. Yeah. Are you alien? Yes. Is that all right? Yeah. This series of Doctor Who um, really appeals to teenagers because it has more real elements in it. When Rose argues with her mum, teenagers, of course, relate to that. So they dive right in there and, you know, they're on the same wavelength as Rose. That's all she says, travelling. That's what I was doing. With your passport still in the drawer, it's just one lie after another. I meant to phone. I really did. I just... I forgot. What, for a year? You forgot for a year? So many young children are watching Doctor Who these days because it is... it's so exciting. It's just... it's just one big adventure for them. It's very fast-paced, there's lots of exciting colours, the monsters are very scary, children love to be scared. There's lots of grossness in it, and, and children, they love being grossed out. Our readers are looking to, to read about the, the Doctor and Rose, um, so it's been really, really popular in that sense. We get lots of mail, uh, lots of letters asking about Rose as a character, also about Billy as an actress. She's still got this young appeal about her. She, she's almost like a teenager herself, and I think that adds to her popularity, and it's, it's something that all of our readers really identify with. Back in a sec. He said not to look for it. Yeah, he did. They really love Rose because she's really cheeky and she's really daring and in their minds they think that they could possibly be like her. Now you get it. I imagine our readers are running around attacking each other or trying to kill each other. Um, and it, it's always happened. It goes back to when I was five, when you would play Doctor Who in the playground and, and have fun exterminating people and who was going to be the Doctor, who was going to be the companion. Uh, I imagine that's exactly the same in the playground, like now, thanks to Doctor Who coming back. In this new world of Who, even the music has received a makeover. For the very first time, the BBC National Orchestra of Wales are in the studio recording a new working of the Doctor Who theme. I've been um, working on the arrangements with Ben Foster, who's a young orchestrator and a composer in his own right. And perhaps we come a step closer to making it sound the way I want it to. Friends and colleagues are, are big fans of the show, so it's you know it's really funny then when you when you're able to tell them over a pint in the pub, you know that you uh, did the music for Doctor Who the day before. The music for Doctor Who, I mean, it is, it's all about the, its exuberance and um, there's a, a kind of sense that it must be full of life. I mean, I think that's the main thing that everybody talks about whenever they mention, you know, the new series. 
Well, it's fantastic, you know, because I live in Cardiff myself. So when I drive down St Mary's Street now and remember when they blew, blew the whole street up on the last series, absolutely fantastic. At the other end of the Welsh musical spectrum, local rap band Goldie Looking Chain are also well made up that Doctor Who is being filmed in South Wales. We always like to take a couple of minutes over which Doctor Who we're going to watch and then a presentation will be done after we've all said time relative dimension in space. Go <laughs> every single Doctor Who ever made. We'll go all the way down here. New box set. Hey! New box set. I think what is nice about it being filmed in Newport and Cardiff is it increases the probability that a local band like the GLC could become involved in an episode. <laughs> that, you know, we could just be there in half an hour flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah imagine that. Film. <laughs> <laughs> GLC fights the Cybermen. Yes, yeah. Cybermen. that's a very good idea. Russell yeah. T. Davis. Russell Davis. Russell Davis. Fantastic. GLC fights Cybermen. Fight Cybermen. Perter's annual, 1975. Look at that. Look, look how great he looks here. Time to relative dimensions. Time to I, I love you, Mum. I love you, Dad. People are always ready to take the mickey out of fans, and actually it's a pool of people with a shared love of something. No one ever takes the mickey out of football fans. Everyone thinks that's marvellous and macho and brilliant and fantastic. If you're a fan of a television programme, you're considered to be an idiot. And it's not fair, and it's wrong, and, and the men from Linda are liberating that opinion, I think. Coming out of my cage and I've been doing just Washing batteries, <laughs> washing batteries. I'd be glad to see the back of it tonight, and I can be human tomorrow and eat me dinner and use my mobile.